and I'll share screen and I will come over here. There's a handout up front. Uh, if you didn't get it, the handout is from the uh, SQL quiz repository. Uh, Mike is Vicky's SQL quiz. And there is a third uh, SQL quiz practice down here. Uh, this quiz will happen not next class period. That will be the quiz related to the practice two right here. Uh, so next class period is the quiz on all the different set operations and the outer left and right joins. Uh, and again, everything in these first two quizzes, the one we already had and the one that we're going to have this week is all from uh, the like SQL standard information and things that are going to translate 100% uh, between every database, no matter what system you're using. The stuff we're transitioning into right now is Postgres specific things. Um, so last Friday, really shortly, we talked about that array data type, which is Postgres specific. And uh, today, uh, or this week, we're going to be talking about more Postgres specific stuff. And it's going to be uh, sort of blended in between Postgres specific stuff and general SQL stuff. Uh, probably today, everything that we'll talk about will be Postgres specific stuff. And then Wednesday, we'll get to uh, more uh, sort of general things that apply to uh, every database. Uh, but the big picture idea of our goals for this week is uh, thinking about uh, measuring the amount of disk space that our database is actually using. And so uh, that, again, is, uh, today is mostly going to involve Postgres specific things. You'll be actually counting the number of bytes that Postgres uses to store different things. And we will be doing that. Uh, you will be doing that on the next quiz for next week. And that's specific to Postgres because just the size of everything is going to be specific to Postgres, but the principles uh, between databases, all definitely the same. The, um, this idea of storing redundant data is something that I don't think we'll get to at all today, um, but how to prevent your database from storing redundant data, that is a general purpose, general principle thing that would apply to all databases. And um, a number of people have asked about like uh, why the Pajilla database is structured exactly the way it is, uh, why you have to join things in certain ways and not other ways, for example. And that will come down to talking about the redundant data and how uh, the Pajilla authors decided to avoid redundant data in certain ways. Um, but before talking about that general principle of avoiding redundant data, in order to make this discussion a little bit more concrete, we're going to talk about exactly uh, how Postgres physically stores all the data that it works with. And um, that will be, uh, again, the, the quiz, the SQL quiz for next week and probably all of today. The, there is a Pajilla 3 homework and that will be the last homework before the midterm. Uh, so the midterm will happen sometime next week. Uh, it'll be a take home thing again. The main difference between the, uh, the midterm and the, the homeworks is just that the midterm, you won't be allowed to talk to any, any other people in any way, uh, but the homeworks uh, you're allowed to in those sort of limited ways. And um, Yeah, again, I think the, uh, uh, the midterm, most people will find it pretty straightforward and I expect to get uh, lots of good grades. Um, uh, so hopefully not something to stress out about too much. But the only thing that will be on the midterm is the, uh, the Pajilla specific stuff. Question, yes. Um, are we gonna have expected results? Oh yeah, so for the midterm, the main way Technically, the midterm is different from the assignments is that there won't be expected results. And so you'll have to uh, just uh, 
be able to interpret the English, whatever it's saying. And uh, when, I, when I grade the homeworks, I'm not going to do just like a diff to see, did you get exactly the expected results? I'm actually gonna read the SQL code and just see, okay, the main idea for this one was doing either a left join or a, uh, uh, a particular subquery. And if you got the, the main idea, then you'd get the, the credit there. So the midterm's not gonna grade on subtle details like, uh, um, did you order by the columns in this particular way? Um, other question? Uh, yeah, so, and then, yeah, for the midterm, um, the uh, motivation or the, like, the idea is that it would be like you're at a company and you're just given an assignment by your non-technical bosses about what to do and, um, uh, reproduce that. So you'll have access to any possible resource other than uh, another human being um, because you have signed a non-disclosure agreement with your company to not uh, disclose their internal details to other people. Um, and again, the, besides like simulating that uh, working environment, the goals that it simulates the uh, the interview sort of situation as well, that if you can do all the things on the midterm, then you'll do really well on SQL interviews. So I'll hand back, yeah, look. Um, do you have any idea what days the midterm might be? Question is what days the midterms will be. And uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm open to suggestions. It'll be pretty flexible. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, you, uh, but okay, so we will, so yeah, so spring break the week after, I definitely don't want you to have to be thinking about it at all during spring break. Uh, so what if, so the, the Pajilla 3 homework is due Tuesday, quiz on Wednesday. So how about I post it Wednesday and have it due Friday? Of next week. Um, posting the midterm. So that way uh, you'll have, you'll be able to have fully gotten feedback on the Pajilla 3, completed that, uh, get, uh, do the quiz, get feedback on the quiz, and then, um, uh, then you'll have the rest of the week before spring break to, to do the, the midterm. Okay, that'll be our tentative plan. And unless somebody uh, complains, then then we'll stick with that. Yeah, next next Wednesday week, so like ten days from now. Yeah. So. Uh, I can't bring up my normal little calendar here because Zoom is blocking it. But uh, next week is not spring break. So you will complete the midterm next week before spring break. Like Wednesday to Friday. Yeah. That, nope, uh, you can access the Lambda server from anywhere with an internet connection. So if you're leaving for spring break on Wednesday, then totally okay. and. Uh, do the, the assignment a little bit over spring break. Uh, but yeah, you can access it from anywhere. Um, the only reason why I don't want to do Tuesday to Friday is because then the quiz on Wednesday cover overlaps with the, the midterm. So yeah, so you, the, um, if we really, if people really wanted to do Tuesday, uh, then we could have a quiz on Monday instead of Wednesday. Uh, but then, okay, uh, okay. Well, yeah. Tentative schedule: uh, Friday or Wednesday to Friday. If people, um, uh, it's not set in stone though. Yes. Uh, questions? How many questions? And it'll be significantly shorter than the Pajilla assignments. So I don't know exactly, but uh, maybe like on the order of five questions.
Okay, yes. Uh, I, I don't know yet. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, administrative stuff out of the way, sort of, um, up in the air. Technical stuff next. We are, again, the handout is on the SQL quiz right here, number three. We're going to go over that. And uh, as we do it, we'll talk about how Postgres internally actually is physically storing all of this information so that we can interpret how much space all of our tables are going to take up. And this will aid us in our understanding of how to design a good database. And again, it will, um, after the midterm, we'll be transitioning away from how do you make SQL queries correct to how do you make them fast? How do you make your code fast? And in order to understand how to make things fast, we have to really understand exactly how things are represented. So inside of this my SQL quiz uh, repo here, I have this quiz practice 3.sql file. Um, if you update your repository, then you can have access to that file as well. The inside of this file, you'll see that there are um, create table commands and insert commands, no select statements anywhere. And so the idea here is that you will have to, um, there's two types of problems here about what to do for the create table statements and what to do for the insert statements. And on your uh, actual quiz, you can expect to have two of these create table commands and uh, two different insert commands. We'll talk first about the insert and then about what to do for create table here. Um, down here, let's do Docker PS. Do I have anything running? I do. I'll do bring it down real quick. Docker compose spelled correctly down. Docker PS, nothing running. Docker compose up dash D. And then uh, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to rerun the command that uh, I was using before to uh, pass the SQL file, the SQL file, to the database. Press Control R, look for the dash T. The command looked uh, something like uh, this. The key thing here, so we have Docker Compose, and then we're doing the input redirection, passing in a particular file. We'll do the number three like this. And then the exec uh, dash T is needed whenever you're using input direction. And we're passing this to uh, psql right here on the PG surface. Hit enter. And you get a bunch of inserts and create tables, hopefully no uh, error messages. Uh, you'll notice, though, uh, if I run this a second time like this, you will get a bunch of error messages because uh, it'll tell you that the table that you're trying to create already uh, exists. And so if you do do something like this in order to get back to a sane state, the thing to do is just to do docker compose down, delete everything. Again, uh, this is all ephemeral, so just bringing it down will delete everything in the database. Up dash D again rerun the uh, psql loading command and make sure to run it just, just once. And then uh, you can take off the dash t, take off the input redirection here, and enter uh, psql like this. Type backslash d like this. Uh, you still have the basket a and basket b from before, but now there's a bunch of new things inside of here. Uh, <clears throat> any questions on the setup? of the problem so far, or the setup of our quiz before talking about what to do for the individual problems? Okay, so we're starting with the insert statements. And the idea of here, when we look at these insert statements, we're going to have to count exactly how many bytes does this insert statement take up. In order to do that, we're going to have to refer to the create table statements and understand exactly what all of these different data types are and how they're stored internally and um, how many bytes they take up. There's a number of good tools in Postgres that will help you here. And so if we come back over to the GitHub repository for this week under this row overhead section, um, there's all the things that you'll need listed right here. 
in particular, in there's uh, these tutorials, two tutorials right here. We'll have uh, actual, if you want to read through these tutorials, you don't have to, but if you do read through them, they contain actual uh, commands inside of them that just solve all of the uh, quiz problems. And so you're welcome to on the actual quiz. Uh, if you read through these beforehand, figure out how to use the tools that they provide to just answer the, the, the quiz problems, you're welcome to do that on the quiz. The, uh, I don't think I mentioned this actually beforehand, but at the top of this file, it's telling you that there's a different format uh, for this quiz. And in particular on this quiz, in this quiz alone, you are allowed to use a computer. Um, so not to send messages to each other, but to connect to a running database. So basically doing what we're doing down here. And uh, you can reference arbitrary documentation on the internet. So that includes like the Postgres documentation. And for example, those, uh, those links that actually have the answers or commands that will give you the answers to these problems. Uh, yeah, the only thing that you're not allowed to do is just use the internet to communicate the actual answer to other people. Any question on the, what you're allowed to do or not allowed to do on the quiz? You're also allowed to have the same sort of handouts uh, that you can write on um, whatever you want notes wise and um, uh, um, just additional things that you're allowed to do here. Okay. Um, so um, Postgres, um, yeah, so the row overhead, uh, this row overhead is the like standard phrase for talking about how many uh, bytes we're going to be using to insert this information and store it in, the, in our hard drives. And uh, Postgres is a little bit uh, famous or infamous for having more row overhead than other databases. Uh, that's part of what makes Postgres more resilient to uh, hardware failures and other types of failures. Um, but it also historically in say like 20 years ago made Postgres slower than MySQL. And so um, uh, 20 years ago, uh, there were lots of good reasons to choose MySQL over Postgres for issues like this. Nowadays though, those, uh, those issues are uh, pretty much negligible. And so it's true that we'll see there's a little bit more overhead, but it's gonna be a small amount of overhead. Uh, each row is divided into three sections, header, data, and padding. And so in order to uh, calculate how much data uh, your insert statement is going to take up, you'll just calculate um, how much data the header, the data, and the padding sections take up and add all that together. So in the header section, uh, it's by default will take uh, 23 bytes. That's the minimum amount that a header can take up. And the only way to actually find this out is by reading the, uh, the, the actual source code for Postgres. A lot of the documentation um, inside of uh, Postgres is uh, part of uh, uh, the source code here. And um, uh, um, yeah. So there's the link to the more detailed uh, documentation. Um, we will be going into uh, later in this class exactly what all these different fields are doing and why it takes up 23 bytes. But for now, uh, it's just a 23 byte thing that stores a bunch of stuff. In addition to this 23 byte thing, there's something called a null bitmap, which is inside of the header. And uh, the null bitmap is only present if the tuple contains at least one null value. If the uh, tuple contains no null values, then there is no null bitmap needed. Let's come back over here to our first insert statement uh, right here. And you can see that there is in fact a null value being inserted right here. So uh, because of that, we will need both a, uh, the standard 23 byte header and the null bitmap. So we'll need the uh, 23 bytes, or break it up like this. In the header section, we will have the 23 byte standard header and the null bitmap. And we just have to figure out next how much uh, space this null bitmap is going to take up. Um, the null bitmap uses one bit per column. Um, and that's uh, whether the column is nullable or not nullable, does not matter. You still have to use one bit per column. And then you round that up to the nearest eight bits. So here, come back over here. 
there are one, two, three, four, five, six uh, columns that were being inserted right here. Uh, but more importantly, there's actually six columns in the table right here. This is what you have to actually uh, uh, count is the number of columns in the table. And so there's six uh, bits that are needed to store uh, in the bit in the in the null bitmap, uh, one for each of these columns, and we round that up to eight. Uh, so six bits rounded up to eight bits equals one byte. And that will be the size of our uh, of our header right here, where that, that's the size of our null bitmap. The final header is the sum of this and this uh, rounded up to the nearest eight byte multiple. Uh, so add this together, 23 bytes, 23 bytes plus one byte equals 24 bytes. And 24 bytes is divisible by eight. And so uh, this will just stay at 24 bytes. In the next uh, couple of examples, there'll be some where this will not be 24 bytes. Um, but vast majority of time, this will be 24 bytes. Uh, and that'll be the size of our header for this insert statement right here. Before we go on, any questions about why this is 24 bytes or how we calculated that? OK. Um, I'm going to skip down to this uh, network connection right here. And we'll take a look at an example with this network connection um, table and inserting into it. And the first thing that I want us to identify as a difference between this network connection table and the example table up above is that every one of these columns right here has the not null, has a not null inside of it. This primary key right here, it's a little bit tricky what exactly primary key means. Um, but primary key is the same as having what's called a unique constraint and a not null constraint. There's no difference between the word primary key and unique and not null added together. Uh, so the not null just means it's never possible to insert a null value in this particular column. Uh, we'll talk about the unique constraint a little bit more when we're talking about the, uh, uh, the next section of this week's um, topic. Um, but the key thing here is primary key means that we can't be null. And so all of these things can never be null. And so we can never have a null, a null bitmap uh, because we can never insert a null value. Down here, uh, if you look at the actual insert statement right here, there are no null values right here being uh, inserted. And so if we take a look at the size of this header, it's always, again, going to be the 23 bytes for the, the main header part. And then in this case, it will be zero bytes for the null bitmap, because there is no null bitmap. Uh, and uh, so we add those two things together, 23 plus 0 equals 23. But then we still have to do the round up step to the nearest multiple of 8. And 24 is still the nearest multiple of 8. Round up to nearest multiple of eight. And so it's still going to be um, still 24 bytes. Any questions about that one? Then the last example down here, we have this uh, event right here. And this one has many, many columns inside of it. And uh, right uh, down here on our insert into events, we're only explicitly specifying two of these columns. I'm not using the word null anywhere over here, but every value that you don't specifically specify is going to be null. So there are many, many null columns here, even though it's not actually listed as null here. Uh, so here, again, our header uh, has the required 23 bytes inside of it. And now the null bitmap, uh, there's only two things that were specified. We count out how many things there are up here. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 15 columns. So there's 13 columns that have nulls inside of them. Everything that is not not null has been specified with a null. Um, so null bitmap has 13 bits, round up to uh, the nearest 8-bit 
uh, size to get the size of the null bitmap uh, is 16 bits equals two bytes. Add the 23 bytes to the two bytes and you get 23 plus two equals 25 bytes. This is now bigger than 24 bytes. And so we have to round up to the nearest multiple of eight. Round up to nearest multiple of eight implies 32 bytes for the header. Uh, so in general, or vast, vast majority of times, like 90% of the times, things are 24 bytes. If you have a really large column, really large table, things will be 32 bytes. You would have to have an exceptionally large number of columns, uh, over 256 columns, in order to get up to 40 bytes in your header size. Um, yeah, there's, uh, I don't know, a lot of sort of technical weirdness that's going to go on into doing these calculations. Um, but uh, once you just see what the technical weirdness is, even if you don't understand fully why, what there is this technical weirdness, actually doing the calculations and getting the sizes is not going to be super tricky. Uh, but any questions at this point? Yes. Question is, in this insert statement here, uh, I said there are two uh, columns that are not null and 13 columns that are null. And the question is, why do we have null columns if the uh, there's no null keyword over here? And the answer, this is uh, part of where uh, the trickiness in insert statements comes into, is that uh, every column must have something inside of it. And uh, so here, the location ID will be equal to zero and start time will be equal to this thing over here. Uh, but then what happens to like all of these ints right here, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, what's going to be inside of it? Uh, well, the default value for them is going to be null because there is um, nothing specified. And since there has to be something, that something will just be null. Question is, why are we counting the null? Um, um, uh, so yeah, the question is why did we count the the, the null columns? The answer is in the uh, the null bitmap right here. In order to know how many uh, bits are being set for the null bitmap, we have to know how many columns there are in the table. And uh, actually, I have a slight typo right here. It doesn't affect our final answer. But the size of the null bitmap is always the size of the number of columns in the table itself. So the size of the null bitmap is 15 bits. Um, even though we have some of these that are not null, um, it's still 15 bits here because we have 15 columns. That still rounds up to 16 bits, which is two bytes. The two bytes plus the 23 bytes is still uh, rounds up to the 32 bytes to get a multiple of eight. Um, so the size of the null bitmap, if you have a null bitmap, is always equal to the, um, the number of columns in your table. So 15 bits because there's 15 columns. Um, if we did not have, if all of the columns were specified here, where we had no columns uh, that were null, then there would not need to be a null bitmap. And uh, then uh, the header would just be 24 bytes. Um, I'm not sure if that answered your question or not. The size of the null bitmap is always the size of the, uh, the, the number of columns that you have. Yeah. Even though some of those columns can never be null because of this not null constraint right here, they're still included in the, um, in the null bitmap down here. Uh, the reason for that, and it's totally okay if you don't understand what I'm about to say, um, but the reason for that is if we ever want to adjust this table, change this table to remove this uh, not null constraint or to add a not null constraint somewhere else, we don't want to have to go through every single row in the table, especially if it has billions of rows inside of it. Um, and so by enforcing that uh, the size of the null bitmap is always for every uh, uh, column, it ensures that uh, adding or removing these null constraints uh, can happen in constant time instead of linear time. Um, uh, 
Question is, if we add values to each of the columns, does the answer change? And the answer um, here is going to be different if uh, uh, if every if every value is not null. Um, and I don't have uh, a, an example written out here, but if we actually listed out 15, all 15 of the columns right here, then there would be no, no null bitmap and the size would be 24 bytes. If, if at least one, if more than zero columns are null, then you do have a null bitmap and it's always included for every column. Um, Okay, that's all the information about the header. What we're gonna go on to next is how much each of these uh, columns are actually uh, taking up. And this is the, uh, the trickiest parts of the, these problems. And you'll have to go through and actually run some SQL commands in order to determine this. If we come back over to the, uh, the readme file, the topic six notes, and scroll down here to the data section. This has the information about um, uh, computing the, the amount of bytes used by each particular column. The first thing that we have to do is, uh, well, any column that is null consumes uh, zero bytes disk space. Um, so the advantage of having null as your uh, value means that you're not going to consume any disk space. Uh, every column that does have a non-null value will require a number of bytes depending on that column type. And in order to determine how many bytes that's going to be, there's this special uh, uh, query that you can run. And I'm going to go ahead, copy this from the notes and come over to uh, PSQL down here, paste that in right here, and we'll run that to see what the output is. Down here, there's this type name column over here that has the name of all the different types. And then there is the type length over here, which tells you how many bytes Postgres actually uses to uh, store uh, that information. So if we want to know how many bytes the int eight type up here uses, then we can just under type name, find int eight right here and see that it uses eight bytes. Uh, the integers int eight and four and int two are cleverly named so that there's a number over here telling you how many bytes it takes up. Uh, so here, this will be eight bytes, four bytes, two bytes, and then we have to find out this care. The care takes up a single byte. Uh, this represents an ASCII uh, value, one byte right here. And then this line, uh, one of the things that's gonna happen in the quiz and on the midterm is I'm going to give you uh, weird types that uh, you'll probably never use in the real world, uh, but you'll still have to uh, maybe use the documentation or uh, uh, use your imagination a little bit to figure out exactly what might be stored in one of these uh, different types. And so here for the line type, uh, in order to find in the paging environment down here where the, uh, the, that type is, uh, real quick, I'll just press shift G to take me to the end. You can see there's a lot of different types in Postgres 420. So you don't want to have to uh, manually go through all of these things. Instead, uh, uh, you'll want to use the slash. Again, in any uh, terminal environment, uh, slash will search for you, uh, all inspired by Vim's use of the slash for search. And then type in line like this. The search itself will be case sensitive, but uh, because type names in Postgres and all SQL is case insensitive, then the type names are always represented in the uh, Postgres tables in lowercase. So even though up here I have it as an uppercase line, down here I'm searching for lowercase line and I hit enter and we find out that this takes up 24 bytes right here for this type. The last one down here, JSON B. I'm going to press slash and search for JSON B like this. And there we go. You'll see that this takes up negative one bytes. Any positive number is the actual number of bytes that something takes up. If you see a negative one over here, that means that this is going to be something that is variable in size. So negative one implies that it is variable in size and it will depend on the actual like 
value that you put in here. The JSONB type is for storing JSON uh, data and JSON uh, JSON blob can be uh, arbitrary in size. It can be just like an empty list all the way up to like a big tweet or um, uh, millions of tweets. And so this is variable size um, uh, and that's indicated by the negative one here. Anytime I'm giving you one of these problems on uh, this quiz, the anything that is variable size will always have a null value inside of it. And that way you don't have to know the details about like, how to calculate the size of something that'll that's different for every type. Um, uh, you just know that it'll be zero if it's um, uh, going to be a variable size. So for the quiz, think of as zero because it's null. Uh, I'm going to come up for breath here in a second, but um, one of the nice things about uh, Postgres is that uh, columns can be arbitrarily uh, large in Postgres, and there is no other database that uh, allows that. Um, even if you're, so if you're on MySQL, there is a uh, limit uh, uh, for text types of uh, very small limits. Uh, 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 256 is the default with more complicated sort of extensions. You can get uh, something up to a couple of kilobytes or megabytes, things large enough to store documents, but it's a little bit awkward, uses up a lot of extra disk space. Uh, Python, sorry, Python, uh, Postgres, uh, doesn't matter what type you have here, if it's variable size, doesn't, there's no limits on what you can store inside of it or how big it can be. Postgres also automatically compresses for you using gzip compression, anything that's variable sized. And so it's uh, very efficient in terms of its memory usage that way. Uh, you will, if you're looking through the documentation, you will see this thing called uh, TOAST that comes up a lot. TOAST stands for the Oversized Attribute Storage Technique, and it is uh, affectionately called that because Postgres people think it's the best thing since sliced bread. And this is uh, just what enables Postgres to um, store these very, very large types efficiently. Uh, for the purposes of certainly this quiz and most of this class, you can ignore uh, if you see something talking about toast, just know that it lets you store big things, and uh, but you can ignore the details of what's going on. Um, okay, uh, we're uh, almost ready to talk about how much uh, disk space this uh, insert statement here actually uses. Before we talk about how much disk space it actually uses, let's talk about the theoretical best case scenario. So. The theoretical best case would be that we um, just use up exactly the amount of disk space that is indicated up here. No extra overhead, no waste going on. So adding up all those things would be 8 plus 1 plus 4 plus 2 plus 24, which is, that's 10, 34, I believe 39 bytes. Um, uh, but we'll see here in a second that we can't actually get to this theoretical optimum for various complicated reasons. Before we get into those complicated reasons, I will pause and see if there's any questions. Yes. Uh, question is down here on the bottom. How did I get access to it? I'll press Q to leave the pager environment. This is the command that I typed in right here. This command is also available on the readme file under the uh, uh, under we're calculating how many bytes are in the data section right now. So if you go there, uh, this is the uh, the command, and there's a quick summary down here of what all the features of uh, what these columns mean. Um, at this point, we're only interested in the type name and the type length column. Good question. Any other questions at this point? Sophie. Yeah. Why would you choose to use like So the question is, why might we choose to use one of these over the other if one's taking up more space? And the answer is that, so if we have say two bytes here, uh, two bytes is two times eight bits. So the maximum size, max size is, and that, so two times eight is 16 bits. So the maximum size of an integer that we can store is two to the uh, 16, so like 65,000. 
Um, and, uh, but most of the time, uh, or very often when we're storing integers, we want to be able to store numbers bigger than 65,000. And so something like uh, int four lets us do that. Uh, the int four has a max size, max size about uh, four to the, um, about uh, four billion, uh, four times 10 to the ninth. Um, and the int eight one is big enough that uh, I have no idea what it is off the top of my head. Um, um, and historically, uh, most databases or most people say like even uh, 10 years ago would use int four as their preferred uh, data type for integers, um, thinking that this number here is big enough that uh, uh, we're never going to exceed this number, and the difference between four bytes and eight bytes can like double the size of your database. And so, like, going from like I don't know, ten terabytes to twenty terabytes could be expensive. These days, um, uh, disk space is super cheap, and people have run into lots of problems thinking that oh, I'll never use a number bigger than four billion, and then they need the number five billion, and they have to re-architect everything in their database. So unless you have a good reason not to use the int eight, this should be like your default integer type. Uh, good question. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, the question is um, here, I'm only talking about uh, positive numbers. What about negative numbers? All of these values here are uh, signed by default. Um, so actually these include uh, uh, the, the total number of numbers that can be stored is 65,000, which is like negative 32,000 to positive 32,000. And there are unsigned versions of these as well that only store um, positive numbers. Um, Postgres is implemented in C. So for those of you who have used C before, uh, all of these data types uh, are inspired by the C programming language. And there's an equivalent thing from uh, C in, uh, in Postgres for everything. Uh, good question. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so that leads us to the, I think the, the trickiest part of, uh, these problems, which, um, is not, I don't know, super tricky, just easy to make a dumb mistake on. And that's why these are not actually giving us the, uh, the theoretical optimum up here, but, uh, something different. Uh, in order to get the theoretical optimum, again, we needed only the type name and the type length, uh, only these two columns. But there's this thing called alignment in uh, Postgres. This is actually something that is fundamental to the way modern CPUs work. And uh, again, low level languages like assembly and C, you have to think about this alignment all the time. Uh, those of you who've only used Python before, this is something that'll be totally uh, unfamiliar. Inside of, uh, so I'm going to rerun this command so that we can look at some examples of this alignment here. Uh, this column right here, type align, has uh, four different possible values, C, I, C, D, and S, as to uh, what, uh, how things can be aligned. And if we come back over to the, uh, the notes uh, for this particular query, there's a link to the table documentation over here. And this is what you'll have to use in order to decipher exactly what this type align is doing. So if you click on this link, to do, and then we're going to search for type align, and I will not use a lame shortcut like Control F. I'll use the cool shortcut like slash because Firefox uh, uh, programmers are also using Vim to implement Firefox. And so I'll press slash, and that opens up my quick find down here, and I'll type type align, and take me to the column uh, information about type align down here. And down here it tells us. Um, uh, what's called the alignment for each of these types. And so basically for each of these different uh, letters, um, there's gonna be a number associated with that letter. This number over here means that um, the starting byte of uh, that type must be divisible by this number over here. Uh, so we're going to work through the examples here, and as we work through it, I'll come over, uh, refer back to this, and we'll see exactly what I mean by the starting byte must be divisible by this number. So back up here, 
we have the uh, int eight as our first uh, type right here, this ID. Uh, things always get stored in Postgres starting from uh, left to right or top to bottom in your column. So it'll be the ID column, then A, B, C, D, E, and F. And when we're calculating the amount of data being used, um, so now this is the data portion that we're calculating right here. Uh, you'll always start from the uh, uh, left to right now, going uh, this column, then this column, and so on. Uh, the first column, ID, int eight. So we'll find the int eight right here. And it has a type align right here of D. Uh, so we'll look up in our documentation. D stands for double. Uh, so eight bytes, the, uh, the number, the byte number that the ID starts on must be divisible by eight. We are currently at byte number 24. You will always guarantee to be uh, divisible by eight in your first uh, data entry right here because the header must uh, end at something divisible by eight. So the ID starts at byte eight. And then the size of this, um, the size of this is eight bytes. Size equals eight bytes. And so it ends at byte by B-Y-T-E right here of uh, eight plus 24, 32. Now we'll go on to the next column. The next column is the care right here, A. Doo -doo. A lot of people pronounce this char instead of care. That uh, annoys uh, me very much, annoys uh, a lot of like any sort of hardcore C programmer because uh, this is obviously short for character and nobody says character, they say character. So this should be pronounced care and not char. Um, if we look up our car type down here or our care type right here, the uh, type length is one and the type of line over here is C. So uh, care again starts at byte 32. It starts at byte 32 right here because the ID starts at 32. And if we come over to here, the care, uh, there's no alignment uh, needed. So it can start at any possible number. So uh, that's good. And the size here is equal to, so care size is equal to one, size equal one byte. And so it ends at byte 33. Come back up. And the next one here is an int four. B is an int four. And so uh, int4 starts at, the previous one ended at byte 33, but if I come over to, whoops, down here, let's look at int4. Int4 has a type align of I right here, a type align of I right here. Coming over to this uh, documentation, I, the alignment must be four bytes, must be four bytes. And so 33 here is not divisible by four. I have to insert padding between the character and the int four so that the int four can start at something uh, divisible by four. The next number up here divisible by four is 36. So int four starts at 36. And then the size here equals uh, four bytes. Um, size equals four. So it ends at byte uh, 40. Here, the key thing about here about this one is that we have uh, somehow wasted three bytes that are not storing information. The three bytes that si sit between int four and the care, totally wasted, cannot be used for anything at all. Any questions about that? Yes. Question is, how do I decide where it starts? The answer is for each one of these uh, columns right here, the way I decided where it starts is I took where the previous thing ended and then I make it divisible by whatever number is appropriate for that uh, type align. So here for int four, the previous thing ended at byte 33. And I look at int four and see that it has a type align right here of I. In order to understand what I means, I go back to the documentation on the type align column, what it means. And I look at the I value and it says the alignment must be to four bytes right here. And so I have to, uh, 33 is not divisible by four. I have, so I can't start at byte 33. I have to start at something divisible by four. So I go up to the next value divisible by four. The next value divisible by four is 36. And so that's why the int four right here starts at 36. 
For the care and the ID, I did those same exact procedures, um, but it just so happened that the care uh, position starting at 32 divisible by eight. So anything is always, if, it, if, if you have a number divisible by eight, anything can always start there. Um, so uh, there was no padding here, no wasted space between the ID and the care. And similarly, no wasted space between the header and the ID right here. Uh, the only wasted space that we have so far is between the care and the int4 right here, because int4, because of its type align right here, must be divisible by four, and the previous one did not end at something divisible by four. Did that answer the question? Canola, did you have a... Sorry, um, that is a good question. That's a typo. Um, that ID should start at uh, byte 24 right here. This should match exactly what this is up here. I accidentally wrote eight because I was getting ahead of myself and typing out the size of the of the um, uh, thing. Um, uh, but yes, good catch. So that should start at 24. Good question. Any other questions? Um, so the next one, the int two, doo -doo -doo. int two starts at, in order to know where it starts at, I have to know what its alignment is. The alignment for the int two is an S. S stands for short, S equals short right here. Uh, and so that's two bytes over here. And um, uh, 40 is divisible by two. So the int two can start at 40. Its size is equal to two. And so it'll end at 42. The line type is next, starts at, we have to uh, come down here again, search for the line, and we have a D for double as our uh, type alignment right here. So eight bytes um, over here, 42 not divisible by uh, eight. So we have to jump up to uh, 48 right here. Uh, the size for the line is 24, size equals 24. And so it'll end at, what is that, uh, 72? Yes, ends at 72. And here we, again, we have some uh, wasted space. We, in this case, we wasted uh, six bytes of space between the start here and the end there. The very last thing was the uh, the JSON B, but again, because the JSON B has a null value, we don't include it at all. And uh, uh, so now we're done with the data section. We know uh, the header section goes up to the first 24 bytes, then the data section is going to go up to uh, byte 72 down here. Any questions? Okay. Um, the do, 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 coming back over here. The last uh, section of our row information. Uh, so we have header data. The last section is another padding section. And the padding section just has to make the entirety of the row be um, something that is divisible by uh, eight. So if we come over here and we're close out of that. Am I looking at the right thing? I just scrolled way down. That's why I'm confused. There we go. Into this uh, example right here, we have the header and the data and the padding. Um, we have to make this uh, divisible by eight. 72 is already divisible by eight. So um, zero bytes in the padding because 72 mod eight equals zero already. Um, so the final size, final size of the row is 72, 72 bytes. Any questions about that? This is, yeah, super technical details, uh, really getting into the weeds here at this point. And so the question is maybe um, on one of your mind or on people's minds is like, why does this matter at all? Why are we talking about this? 
several reasons. The first reason is to just force you to get some uh, practice with referencing the Postgres documentation and uh, going back and forth between uh, PSQL commands that uh, get you the documentation about a particular type like this and the uh, uh, the actual like web page uh, documentation, getting you practice interfacing between those two things. The other is that uh, this is all these details will have very important runtime uh, differences for us uh, once we start working with uh, large tables. And so you'll need to uh, be able to uh, calculate these things uh, here in the future uh, to predict performance. A more immediate thing is, or maybe another more immediate question about uh, that you might be asking is that uh, if we had these wasted values right here, these wasted uh, rows, is there anything that we could do, these wasted bytes, is there anything that we could do to get rid of these wasted bytes and actually use them correctly? The answer is that we can reorder things in Postgres, reorder these columns, and uh, depending on the order that you have the columns, uh, the, uh, the overhead will be different. So the, uh, the overhead of the row is sensitive to the, uh, the order of your columns. And uh, in general, the procedure for getting the most efficient uh, column ordering uh, it's not 100% guaranteed to always work, but it's 99% guaranteed is uh, uh, GitLab policy uh, has a specific link right here that uh, uh, describes exactly the, the procedure. Um, but the, the basic idea is that you order the columns from the largest to the smallest. If you order columns from the largest to the smallest, you'll be good in 99% of the cases. So order columns from largest to smallest. And for the purposes of our quiz, uh, uh, the, doo -doo -doo, the create table statement up here, um, uh, for each of the create tables, you'll have to reorder the columns to use the least amount of disk space. And the way that you'll do that is by actually reordering the columns from largest to smallest. Um, in this case, so now that we've we already have written out all of the uh, the sizes down here, the reordered better create table command create table example two would look something like d line and then id int eight a uh, b care sorry uh, b is the int four. C is the int two, and then A is the care, and then E is the JSON. B at the bottom down here uh, with the, uh, the negative one. Anytime you have things that are uh, variable size, those would always go last. Uh, doing this will result in less wasted space because now uh, the int two right here can sneak into the space that was wasted previously after the int four up here. And the care can sneak into the space that was wasted after the int two right here. Any questions about that? Great question. The question is, does the order that you insert rows into the table matter? And the answer is, uh, at this point, no. Uh, it doesn't affect what we call the row overhead of an individual row. Um, but we will see uh, after the midterm that there are uh, other types of overhead that will be affected by the order that you are uh, inserting rows. Um, so at this point, uh, the order of insertion uh, does not matter at all. Uh, and it's also true that the order of uh, that you insert the columns does not matter. That here, this insert statement right here uses the, uh, uh, the default column ordering because I didn't specify a column list over here. We come down to the, I'm pressing shift D to dump to the bottom inside of Vim. If I were to specify a column ordering like this in my insert statement, then I can insert, I can specify the values of the columns in a different order but it is not the order of the columns in the insert statement that matters. The order of the columns in the insert statement does not matter. Order of columns in 
insert statement does not matter, only the order of columns in the table declaration matters. Good question. This is something that from a, like a programming language perspective, it is very unsatisfying that uh, changing the order of a uh, create table statement has a performance impact. That's very unsatisfying because this should not have any semantic impact on our, um, on our code. This is supposed to be something that is semantics free, uh, but in Postgres, it does have a semantic impact. The Postgres are developers are aware that this is like an ugly thing about uh, Postgres and they want to fix it, but uh, because of various implementation details, uh, nobody is trying to fix it right now, it kind of touches a lot of things inside the Postgres code. And uh, so if you're creating tables, you just should create it in a proper order. The most common way that these things uh, get out of order is because people put the, uh, the they like to put the ID as the very first thing in a table. That's sort of semantically what would be, make the most sense. Um, but uh, in, in practice, it's better often not to have your ID be the very first thing. Um, this practice of shuffling around columns to be uh, in the most efficient way possible is called column Tetris inside of Postgres. And uh, the non-Postgres people will often make fun of Postgres people for having to play so much column Tetris and waste their time with column Tetris. Uh, other databases uh, don't have this problem. Again, if you uh, look at these uh, documents up here, then um, uh, uh, they will internally have uh, some code that you can just run and it will tell you here's the optimal way to uh, create your table. Any questions so far? Yes. So, is the header like different? Question, yeah, is the header different for each row? And the answer is yes. This 23 bytes is actually, it'll have different things inside of it for each row. After the midterm, we'll, we'll dive into detail about exactly what all 23 of those bytes are doing. And um, uh, at this point, though, it's just a magic. 23 number that it's the same for everything. The bitmap uh, for some rows will exist, for some rows it won't exist. Or for some rows it can exist, and other rows it may not exist. It, uh, this will always be the same. Uh, this, the, the null bitmap can be different from row to row. And so in particular, the overall uh, amount of space the header takes up can differ from uh, row to row. Yes. So you're, you're uh, uh, so the question, yeah, so this uh, 72 right here, that'll be the same, like you, if you change this zero to like a one or this A to a B or this weird thing over here, which we don't even know what it is, change that to a four, um, this will all guaranteed to still take up 72 bytes. If we were to change this right here so that instead of, um, uh, these particular values, instead, we had some like nulls in different places, then the row would take up a different amount of space. Um, uh, so at least for the purposes of the quiz, the only thing that can change the size of a row is by adding and removing null values. And adding and removing these null values will also change the, the amount of wasted space as well uh, because of weird padding issues, weird alignment issues. Um, Let's see, uh, we're not gonna go over all of these other uh, examples here, but I do have the numbers of uh, what they take up. I'll just write those out right here so you can check your work on everything. So the first one's 24, then 64, 64, 64, 364s, then a 56, and the last one is a 30. Uh, sorry, a 32 because of the padding. 
Um, and so you can check your understanding by just working through all those problems and making sure that you get those same numbers. These other examples down here are weirder because they have different weird types down here. And uh, I wanna take a look at these uh, right here. This uh, network connection table right here, big serial. Uh, if we, I'm gonna just run, rerun this command down here and press enter. And if I'm gonna do a slash down here, search for big serial. And if I do that, you'll see pattern not found right here because big serial is not actually a uh, special type in, uh, in, post in Postgres. It is not uh, a type that has its own type name. Instead, big serial is a uh, syntactic sugar, is syntactic, syntactic sugar for, um, for two things. The first is the type is a big int type and or actually uh, an int eight type. And the, um, uh, so it allows the, the negative values and the, uh, it has the special property. Uh, anytime you see serial, it has the special property. Special property is that the default value is not null. Put this on its uh, lines. Default value is not null, but whatever the, next value is value. And so if we come down here and actually look at this uh, insertion, oh dear, what did I do? Uh, if we look at this insert uh, set, no number, if we look at this insert command right here. You can see that we have source, destination, start time, byte sent. There is no, uh, there is no ID being specified anywhere, uh, but the default value for that ID is not null. And we can verify that with a select star from network connection there under ID, we have a one down here uh, because just the next initial value is equal to one, not equal to null. If we run this again, um, then you see the next value is two. The next value uh, is it's complicated how Postgres actually determines the next value. You don't need to know how it determines the next value. You just need to know that if you see something with a serial, it's never going to be a null thing in there unless you specifically say the word null. Yes. Yep, the question is, can you specifically set the ID value? And the answer is yes. I'm going to press the up arrow to go back to my insert statement. Um, actually, yeah, let's rerun that here. I'll do backslash E to go into Vim, make this a little bit easier. I, D, G, down, shift F, parenthesis, A. Uh, we'll make the number negative uh, 10 right here, comma, colon, W, Q, like that. And it reran that command. Here's the insert, up arrow, up arrow, back to my select star. And here you can see the negative 10 was inserted. Um, so it's not forcing you to use the next value. It's just giving you a, a reasonable default next value. Um, so the big serial here, the actual type of this column is an int eight. And so um, you uh, press control R, T, Y, P, name. In order to get the size of the big serial, you have to use the size of the int eight. There's a handful of other um, uh, types like this that are not um, going to be listed in this type name column. And I am not going to, uh, or rather, I guarantee on the quiz, there will be types that uh, we're not talking about in class today. And so you will have to, uh, during the quiz, look up in the documentation exactly what the appropriate type name is. So we'll do that next for this. Um, uh, well, let's just take a look at Mac adder right here, uh, sort for Mac address. If I do slash Mac adder, that is in fact inside of here. Uh, there's no eight at the end of this. So it's not Mac adder eight. It's just Mac adder that we're using right here for uh, this one right here. And um, uh, the small int is what we'll look for next. Um, so I'll do slash small int, hit enter, and you'll see that we'll get this pattern not found. Uh, and so somehow we have to figure out the small int. What exactly is it a shortcut for? The easiest way to uh, do this is just, um, actually, I think I have a, this variant, yep, under this note right here. The easiest way to do this is just do a Google search um, for whatever the type is that you're looking for, restricted to the, uh, the Postgres documentation page. And if you do that, then um, uh, picking out the different uh, um, 
uh, I don't know, you have to find the right documentation thing to click, usually be the first one. Um, I clicked on the second one down here just because, um, I don't know why. Let's do the first one. I think they're going to the same page. Um, um, oh, not the same page. Here, if we search for small int, uh, it doesn't actually tell us the, um, uh, the thing that we're looking for, um, but on the second results right here, it does, it does tell us the thing that we're looking for. Control F or rather slash small int uh, right here in this uh, big table about uh, data types. It's this alias, small int is an alias for the, uh, the int two type. Uh, so small int, int two, uh, same thing. And so this, uh, where did it go? Right here. Um, this small int right here is the same exact thing as an int two. And um, so it's the two byte with the two byte alignment. The start time here, the timestamp with time zone um, is another uh, complicated one. Um, if you do a slash right here for timestamp, uh, there's two timestamp types down here. Both of them have the, uh, the same uh, information inside of it or the same byte size. Uh, the timestamp with time zone is just a long way of saying timestamp TZ. So I'll just tell you what that one is without making us look it up right now. Um, the, uh, one of the things about uh, Postgres, you can see that uh, these two things, timestamp without time zone, timestamp with time zone, take up the same amount of bytes. Um, strongly encouraged for your timestamps to always include a time zone in Postgres. The only reason uh, why the, uh, there's a possibility of not including a time zone is that the SQL standard, uh, SQL standard requires a timestamp without time zone. And so uh, that's the only reason that Postgres includes the timestamp without time zone. Uh, you should always include a time zone because otherwise you don't really have a fully specified time. Um, uh, but once you, uh, this with time zone here, this is just awkward syntax. Again, from a programming language perspective, awkward syntax that you have spaces separating uh, the name of the type, but that all is just this timestamp TZ type right here. Save that, come down here uh, and uh, I'll finish. Uh, before we leave today, I'm just gonna write all the answers to uh, these problems so you can verify your uh, answers here, 56. And then three problems down here are uh, uh, 56. 64, nope, sorry, 56, 56, and 64 for, for those problems. Uh, that's where we'll stop for today. If anybody has any questions about things, I will stay after and answer those. I have office hours now too as well. Um, again, uh, quiz on Wednesday is not related to this at all. Uh, but this covers everything about the quiz for a week from Wednesday for next week. So stop that. Stop.